The Black Records The Gods of Creation Before Septian Calendar In the beginning, there were two great gods. One boasted unrivaled courage, the other unparalleled fortitude. They descended from the heavens with their kin, and it was upon the dark land below that they first met. Calamity, their opposing natures incompatible, the two were drawn irresistibly into battle, and thus began a struggle that shook heaven and earth. The goddess and the spirit's laments were for naught. As the land quaked, the skies were torn asunder, and the god's kin could only tremble in fear. After what seemed like an eternity, their clash came to an end. But it was an end of mutual defeat. Their power spent, the empty shells of the two celestial titans were flung into the furthest reaches of the dark land. All that remained in their wake were terrible, their kin, and the great power. The Founding of Heimdall, Year 81 In the years following the Great Collapse, Adjudicator Arnor chose Heimdall as his base of operations from which he planned to rebuild the land of Erebos. Before long, the city became a pillar of the region, and following that, its capital. The citizens, however, continued to suffer in the harsh post-collapse world. They wished for a strong, caring leader to see them through these harsh times. It was in Arnor their wish was granted. After being recognized as an adjudicator by both holy beasts, he was the clear choice. He was crowned as emperor and became the first of many rulers in the Arnor bloodline. Upon his coronation, members of the Septian Church were dispatched from Arteria to endorse the new ruler. The people of Zemuria had lost the objects of their worship in the Great Collapse. However, the Church provided them a new way of connecting with Adios, faith. In addition, by recognizing the legitimacy of rulers across the continent, they strengthened the foundations of its recovering civilizations. In the year 81 of the Septian calendar, the third emperor, Gian Arnor, had a great cathedral built in Heimdall. The cathedral was to be a bastion of faith and would serve as a site to crown future emperors, but it also held a far more significant role. Unbeknownst to the public, an artificial primal ground was created below the cathedral, a replica of the one that existed below Arteria. With the church's increased presence, the desperate times following the Great Collapse came to an end. The people had lost their civilization, but now had faith to sustain them in their search for light in the Dark Ages. However, 200 years later, the darkness that gripped Erebonia would pull them down to the depths of ruin. One of the holy beasts suddenly disappeared, along with the primal ground below the cathedral. It was that same day that the Dark Dragon's miasma laid waste to Heimdall. The Dark Dragon, Year 371 Two hundred years after Heimdall was first founded, ruin rose on monstrous wings from the depths of the earth. Its name was Zoro Agruga, the Dark Dragon, a malevolent creature of terrible power. It spread a miasma throughout the capital that turned Heimdall into a city of the dead. But the horrors did not end there. The evil dragon desecrated the corpses of the fallen, taking control of their bodies and using them to attack those who remained alive, further increasing the legions of the dead. The emperor at the time, Astorius II, was forced to flee the city with what remained of his household and citizens. Together, they retreated south and established a new capital in the land of St. Dark. For a hundred years, the bane of Heimdall went unchallenged until Hector I, the seventh emperor of Erebonia, resolved to recapture the city. Time had proved an ally to the beast, however, and the dragon's influence had spread over the surrounding area like a plague. Undaunted, Hector I led an army of brave knights into the necropolis in an attempt to free it. But though their hearts were steadfast, their arrival was met by legions of powerful fiends, and their efforts seemed doomed to end in failure. It was then that Hector I had a fateful encounter with none other than the great Vermilion Knight, Testarossa. 
The knight recognized Hector I as its master, and bolstered by its immense power and countless weapons, the emperor moved once again on the city into the decisive encounter with the dark dragon. The battle shook the city to its core, and at the end, the Vermilion Knight was victorious. The scourge of Heimdall, the Dark Dragon, was defeated. However, the price of victory was steep. The corrupted blood that flowed from the dragon claimed Hector's life and defiled even the knight itself, placing a curse upon it. The noble Testarossa became the Crimson Calamity, a demon with a thousand weapons that only reacts to the blood of the Arnor family, a destructive force on par with the Dark Dragon that, should control of it ever be lost, would threaten the world and all who live in it. It was sealed deep underground, never intended to again see the light of day. Meanwhile, a new city rose from the ashes of the old, and people once again began to gather in Heimdall, and that was when the vermilion capital that endures to this day was first built. The Magic Knights, Year 527 150 years after the recapture of the capital by Emperor Hector, powerful families rose across the empire as the nation began to establish itself once more. Its various regions gradually condensed into a handful of provinces. The families in power were recognized by the emperor and became overseers of their respective provinces, the nobility. Before long, however, they began quarreling over territory, sparking a great many skirmishes between them in the process. During this time, great knights akin to Emperor Hector's Vermilion Knight appeared across the land and were quickly thrust into the center of these conflicts. The Azure, Palatinate, Ashen, Argent, and Auric Knights were seized by various noble families, granting them overwhelming power and the ability to decide the outcome of battles. Those without the Great Knight's power saw them as bringers of ruin, and before long, certain groups began devoting all their resources to finding some way to combat these unstoppable threats. Thus gave rise to a new creation of Erebonia's mages, golems created by powerful spells, the Magic Knights. Like many other groups of the era, the mages were obsessed with the glory of the ancient Zemirians and devoted themselves wholly to recreating it. Their obsession was funded by an influx of Mira from lesser noble families and assistance from a certain faction. Under their supervision, a slew of magic knights was created, all for the sake of combating the unstoppable power of the great knights. However, the magic knights were not without flaws. Perhaps their greatest failing is that they were unable to be operated unless they could draw power from active spirit veins. They became a successful countermeasure against the Great Knights nonetheless, as spirit veins were always disrupted whenever a Great Knight made an appearance. In the year 527, the first golem that could be considered the prototype for the Magic Knights was created in the workshop of a mage serving a formerly powerful but now long forgotten noble family to the north. At the height of five Arj, this headless golem, known as Olgadia, became a remnant of the mage's trial and error in developing the other models of magic knights. The Lance Maiden, year 942. Two shadows wavered in the corner of a dark, underground room lit only by a small bonfire. I see. So you feel an overwhelming presence, do you? A young maiden stood before the fire, the faint breeze passing through the underground blew her hair, giving it the appearance of a flowing stream of gold, contrasting with the massive silver lance she held in her arms. Oh, are you telling me you wish to turn back before we have even begun? If you are, then so be it. This is far beyond the power of mankind. A young blonde-haired woman with red eyes wielding a dimly shining staff answered in an antiquated tone. The maiden shook her head and urged the woman to open the door before her. It bore the crest of a cross surrounded by spirals. The maiden's name was Leanne Sandlot, the daughter of the Count of Lohengrin Castle in Legram. However, she would be remembered by history as the Lance Maiden. Raised in Legram, known for its masterful teachings of warfare, 
she displayed skill in the art of battle far surpassing her age. At the young age of 15, she was already a match for the castle knights. Said to have godlike mastery of a lance on horseback, it wasn't long before she had completely surpassed the other knights in competitions, amassing a veritable mountain of laurels and awards. The country was amazed by this young girl's incredible talent. The tale of the maiden who was stronger than the knights protecting her spread, and people began to flock to her. At age 16, she began hearing a voice in her head. The voice was austere, yet magnanimous, and it told Leanne of the duty she had to fulfill, and the destiny she had to accept. Naturally, Leanne was upset by this voice only she could hear. However, it wasn't long until she met its owner, a mysterious woman who called herself a witch. The witch spoke of an entity sealed far below the castle, and of Leanne's duty to become its master. Its presence was overwhelming, and once claimed, it would bring its wielder great power, yet it also had the potential to cause great devastation. After much consideration, Leanne made the decision to undergo its trial. It was her way of trying to bring an end to the Empire's conflicts. In addition, as long as she held this power for her own, the noble families would never be able to abuse it. The witch was surprised by Leanne's answer, but recognized her determination and spirit by offering to help her. Thus the door opened, and the lance maiden and the witch proceeded into the trial. Five years later, the demise of the Emperor would lead to the beginning of the largest scale civil war history had ever seen, the War of the Lions. The War of the Lions begins, year 947. In the year 947, Emperor Valius V passed away. His death heralded the beginning of the largest scale civil war in Erebonian history. Valius V was a ruler with a somewhat debaucherous reputation, and is said to have countless wives and concubines. To further complicate the matter of succession, many of those wives came from prestigious noble families, all of whom began competing for power and wanting their offspring to take the throne. Within days of Valius V's death, Crown Prince Manfred, the son of his first wife, was assassinated by an unknown party. Following the death of the Crown Prince, the fourth prince and son of the first of Emperor Valius' secondary wives, Prince Orthros, seized the capital by force. Once in control, he declared himself the new emperor and began purging all those who dared oppose him. The coup set off a succession of counterclaims, and three other princes also named themselves to be the new emperor. Backed by the powerful noble families of their mothers, the competing princes ignited a bloody five-year-long civil war, and thus the War of the Lions began. At first, the prince's armies were largely equal in terms of strength. It wasn't until Orthros, who would later come to be known as the False Emperor, revived the being that had long been sealed under the city that the balance of power shifted. The Testarossa, the legendary Vermilion Knight, now tainted by the blood of Zoro Agruga, saw the light of day once more. With its unmatched strength under his control, Orthros decimated his greatest competition in one fell swoop, and the fifth prince, Gunnar, was defeated. It seemed inevitable that the armies of the other princes would share the same fate, but it was at this pivotal point that the war took yet another surprising and sudden turn. This unexpected development came in the form of another great knight, the Palatinate Knight. The famed champion was acquired by Prince Lucius, the sixth and youngest of the feuding brothers, and with its power he was able to defeat the army of the brilliant strategist and second prince, Albert. Victorious and backed by the knight's power, Prince Lucius was poised to challenge Orthros. Prince Gunnar and Albert's armies, however, were not completely wiped out and decided to join forces with one another in order to oppose the other princes. It was thus that the war became one fought by three separate groups, Prince Orthros with the Vermilion Knight, Prince Lucius with the Palatinate Knight, and Princes Gunnar and Albert, who had no knight, but compensated with their sheer numbers. The War of the Lions had been raging for two years now, and the chaos only worsened by the day. Erebonia seemed fated to fall into ruin and darkness. Fitting, perhaps, for a nation that takes its name from Erebos.
Dreykels takes up arms. Year 949. A young man lays on a grassy plain, enjoying a nap in the peaceful setting. Before long, however, his rest was interrupted by the arrival of a second young man on horseback. The youth wore the trappings of a knight, and his expression was deathly serious. His armor bore many rents and scratches, and his left arm was bound in a bloody bandage. The first man had not seen him in several years, but a cheerful reunion did not seem to be his purpose. You were right after all, the second man said gravely. At this rate, the Empire's days are numbered. At this, the first young man rose from the grass. He was none other than the third prince of the Erebonian Empire, Prince Strykels. As a man with no claim to the throne due to his commoner mother and shunned by the other highborn princes, Strykels had long since left Erebonia behind, wandering from place to place and whiling away his days. Three years prior, he had reached the land of Nord, where he had remained ever since. Though left to his own devices since childhood, his nature was noble, and he was quickly accepted by the people of Nord and lived peacefully among them. But while he had left his homeland, he had not truly abandoned it in his heart. During his wanderings, his mother had passed away, but while she lived, she had told him something that would remain with him for the rest of his days. The blood flowing through you will not allow you to turn your back on the Empire's suffering. Prince Strykels had turned those words over in his head again and again. What could a powerless vagrant like himself truly hope to do? The knight's arrival, however, signified two things. That the war continued to worsen, and that Erebonia was on a certain path to ruination. His mother was probably correct. Hearing the knight's words, he decided that enough was enough. He could ignore the pain of his countrymen no longer. That knight, incidentally, was called Roland. He was a childhood friend of Dreykel's, and his confidant. He was also the man who Dreykel's had left in charge of things in his place before leaving the country. Prince Dreykel set about preparing to depart, but before he could finish, he was met by several of the tall knights of Nord, their cross-shaped spears in hand. They, too, were close friends of Dreykel's, and they volunteered to accompany him and Roland, fearing that the two men alone would not stand a chance. The next morning, the prince departed the village, a mere seventeen men under his command. They bade farewell to the people of the settlement, and its elder wished them well. May the winds and the goddess be with you. He blessed them. Fortune favor you all. The war comes to an end. Year 952. Prince Strykel's opponents were the armies of the 4th Prince Orthros and his Vermilion Knight, 6th Prince Lucius with his Palatinate Knight, and the combined forces of the remaining princes, Gunnar and Albert, who had a legion of magical golems under their control. Yet it was he, the illegitimate son of a commoner and latecomer to the war, who emerged triumphant. His victory did not come without losses, however. During his return to Erebonia, Roland fell in battle. Not long after that, however, he met a woman who would change his destiny forever. The woman was none other than the daughter of Count Sandlot, who hailed from the lakeside town of Legram. Her charismatic personality and peerless skills with the lance earned her the leadership of a band of knights known as the Eisenritter and the moniker Lance Maiden. Her name was Leanne Sandlot. Prince Strykels and Leanne Sandlot may have come from wildly different backgrounds, but their concern for the victims of the war united them in purpose to bring an end to the bloodshed, and it was those shared feelings that made them join forces. The two of them, along with the warriors of Nord, the Eisenritter, and all of the other peoples of the nation whose hearts they moved, liberated one town after another, and were eventually successful in persuading even Prince Lucius, owner of the Palatinate Knight, to fight for their cause. At the same time, however, the false emperor schemed to elevate the cursed Vermilion Knight to even greater power, to godhood. And thus, the Vermilion Apocalypse was created. The demonic god emerged in Heimdall alongside a monstrous castle and vanquished the approaching armies of Albert and Gunnar in a single battle. Their end was anything but conventional, however. 
They were simply erased from existence. Even the Palatinate Knight could not contend with such a foe and was felled. And as it decimated all who challenged the false emperor, countless crimson spirit veins spread out from the castle, stealing the very life from the capital citizens, as well as those in the surrounding area. Defeat seemed all but inevitable for Prince Strykles, the Lance Maiden, and their followers, but they refused to give up. Following the guidance of a kindly witch, they were led to a new great knight, which slumbered on the outskirts of Heimdall. After overcoming a trial, they were able to claim the Ashen Knight and its power. With it in hand, along with their many supporters and the army of Prince Lucius, they marched on the capital for the final time, eventually making their way to the castle at its center. Three days later, on the 4th of July, year 952, the castle vanished from existence, and the city was liberated. The Lionheart Emperor, year 994. Forgive me, you may leave now. Yes, sir. Please call for me if anything happens. The head butler, now in his later years, bowed before leaving. The other man sighed deeply as he lied down on the bed. He was elderly and sick. His well-trained body was as sturdy as a fortress still, and very few would ever doubt the condition of his health. However, he was clearly aging, weakening, and felt his end looming over the horizon. The Lionheart Emperor, otherwise known as Dreykel's Rice Arnar. He was the 73rd Emperor and nearing the age of 70. After ending the five-year-long civil war known as the War of the Lions, Dreykel's had been working tirelessly for 40 years. Although he was enthroned the year the war ended, he had lost his Nord friends and parted with the Witch. He and his vassals worked hard to restore the Empire. I have no regrets. No need to worry about the children, either. The Empress had also urged him to give up on thoughts of the past. She was the daughter of a Marquis who was assassinated during the Civil War, and although she was much younger than he, they fell deeply in love, and she bore him two sons and two daughters. Although she passed several years earlier, their children remained healthy and would shoulder the burden of the reconstructed Empire's future. The next generation is being raised as well. In the first half of the war, his best friend, Roland Vander, gave his life to protect him. And now, Arnor raised his son. The son was already in his forties now, and he flourished as a martial arts master while serving as a military officer. Then, there was Thor's Military Academy. He had established the academy twenty years prior. It was a place for the best and brightest, accepting students from various backgrounds. He'd be surprised. He smiled, thinking of his good friend that had fallen into a deep slumber at the end of the Civil War. The Academy had been constructed at the place they'd first met, and where his friend now rested once more. These long years weren't for nothing then. As long as I can endure that thing until Adios comes for me, that is. He cast his gaze to the corner of the room. There waited the nameless darkness. <sighs> Today, it came again to speak to him, begging pathetically, threatening with intimidation, subtly tempting. He knew what it was, ever since that day, forty years ago, when he took the throne. I suppose I should be happy my children and their descendants won't suffer the same curse. If he were not a man with the heart of a lion, he would surely have been broken by this daily torment long ago. On this day, however, he had a second visitor. Dreykels? An incredibly harmonious voice called out his name, bringing with it a wave of nostalgia. He looked up to see a woman with hair like flowing gold standing at his side. The Salt Pale Year 1178 On July 1st, 1178, at 5.45 a.m., a great catastrophe struck Northambria, then a principality in northern Zemuria. 
A giant white pillar suddenly appeared on the outskirts of its capital, Haliask. The pillar was composed not of snow nor ice, but salt. As such, it was named the Salt Pale. A storm of salt spread outward from it, solidifying everything it touched. Despite only lasting a few days, its effects were felt for months afterwards, as citizens fled south, seeking refuge. In the immediate aftermath of the catastrophe, the number of victims equaled about one-eighth of the country's population. That number rose to nearly a third of the population, with the inclusion of victims in the days that followed. After the incident, the Septian Church led evacuation procedures, provided aid, and employed hundreds from the Bracer Guild to help. In a short time, relief forces from Erebonia, Remifaria, Jurai, Liberal, and the Republic of Calvert had assembled in North Ambria. Meanwhile, the country's leader, Prince Balmun, who had fled to a neighboring country at the start of the catastrophe, had returned to rebuild the government. However, he was met with violence from the enraged citizens for leaving them behind in their hour of need. In the end, he was forcibly removed from power, and North Ambria became a democracy. The remnants of its former armed forces reformed as the Northern Jaegers. Narabonia, their neighbor to the south, had contradictory views on the new autonomous state. On one hand, it refused to recognize the legitimacy of the new democratic government. On the other, it eagerly welcomed the Northern Jaegers. North Ambria's extreme poverty and focus on bringing in foreign currency meant that the former soldiers were easily manipulated by the promise of imperial coin. The Jaeger Corps went around the empire, hiring themselves out to the nobility and newly developing businesses who were fighting over septium and natural resources. They turned out to be the perfect pawns for Erebonia to use in its proxy wars and internal struggles. Despite this, the massive amounts of Mira that flowed in from the Empire helped save North Ambria from its dire straits. 27 years after the catastrophe of the Salt Pale, the Empire annexed North Ambria as reparations for the Northern Jaegers' actions in the Erebonian Civil War. As before, Erebonia's vast resources ended up lifting the former independent state out of its chronic poverty. Shortly after the disaster, the Septian Church restricted access to the northern half of the country. After the annexation, however, the Imperial Army's intelligence division began investigating the Pale, which had since been classified as a, quote, otherworldly singularity, unquote. One of the intelligence division's collaborators has been able to confirm that the members of the Church's dominion retrieved the Salt Pale and brought it back to Arteria. It's rumored, however, that a piece of the Pale still remains on site in North Ambria. The Orbal Shutdown Phenomenon, Year 1203 S1203, February, the southern reaches of the Sutherland Province. All Orbal power came to a sudden stop in the area around Parm and Titus Gate. It had been a relatively mild winter, but without lights, communications, or heaters, the people of Parm found themselves subjected to cold and darkness for an entire week. Sutherland's provincial army was called in to provide aid. After a short investigation, the source of the outage was determined to be a city-sized airship that appeared over Valeria Lake in Liberal, the neighboring kingdom to the south. The floating structure had a height of 5,000 and a length of 3,000 arg. The ancient Zemurian structure drew in nearly all orbital energy from the entirety of Liberal into itself. Thus, the southern reaches of Erebonia were affected as well. Three days after the incident began, the Imperial Army's 3rd Armored Division moved with surprising speed from Drechnor Fortress to Parm, and then on to Titus Gate, giving support to those affected along the way. Though the Army's orbital tanks ceased to function near the Empire's southern border, they also had a large number of steam-powered tanks available. Using the combustion-driven models allowed them to get around without relying on orbital energy. Even the cannons themselves used gunpowder ammunition. Though it wasn't ideal, it was enough to allow them to respond to the situation. The leader of the 3rd Armored Division was Lieutenant General Zex Vander, a member of the family tasked with guarding the Imperial family, and a moderate in an army led mostly by Warhawks. 
He felt conflicted as he led his division south into Liberlian territory. The government's stated reason for his current orders were to protect the citizens during the power outage and assist Liberal during the current crisis. The strange part was that the steam-powered tanks, which were vastly inferior to the orbital-powered models, had been commissioned by the imperial government and provided to the army only a month before the incident. Though the 3rd Armored Division was the first to make it to the border, a number of other divisions were on their way. In the end, the military intervention was stopped thanks to Prince Oliver de Verabonia's imperial family and Brigadier General Cassius Bright of the Liberlian army. With the arrival of Liberal's functioning airship, the Arcel, as proof they could handle the situation without Arabonia's assistance, they were given the time they needed to restore power to the region. As Orbal energy returned to the southern reaches of the Empire, so did relative peace between the two nations. To certain individuals, however, it was clear that the faceless, the Anguis of Ouroboros, responsible for engineering the incident, had connections to Arabonia's intelligence division. The small, autonomous weapons the faceless utilized during this period of time would later come to be known as combat shells. The Twilight Begins, Year 1206 Between flame and earth, the wavering darkness begins to spin the tale of the end. First, the conflict of the great gods of the second pillar. Second, the fusion of earth and flame, and the completion of the seven vessels. Third, the beginning of the thousand-year city, and the acceptance of the Graal. Fourth, the disappearance of the holy beast, and the catastrophe of the whispering dragons. Fifth, the recapture of the capital, and the Vermilion curse. Sixth, the lion's war, and the sacrifice of the holy maiden. Seventh, the appearance of the giant pillar in the north, and the unwanted child. Eighth, the sacrifice of the village and the Hundred Days Campaign. Ninth, the great blue tree to the east and the appearance of the cursed castle. Thus, the thousand-year-old wish was fulfilled. When the sacrifice is made and the ancient blood flows, the path to the growl of Erebos shall open. When the tainted holy beast is pierced by the blade of world's end, and its blood fills the Graal, the great twilight shall fall upon the land. At Twilight's End, Year 1206 After the twilight falls across the land, two great factions will rise. One will be the World Serpent, a voracious steel dragon with seven maws, it will seek to crush the world in its fangs and devour it. The other will be the haze of a thousand flames. It will attempt to beguile the great dragon, entangling it and lopping off its heads one by one. Though shining wings will take to the sky once more, their light alone will be too dim to drive back the coming dusk. The holy maiden's fall will herald the appearance of the false pales and the fortress of the end. Soon thereafter, the world will be plunged into the darkness of night. This fate is absolute. Addendum It should be noted that the contents of this book are the result of a phase engine that examines and records the flow of causality. The ruinous end of this tale, born from the clash between the Crimson Vessel and the Great Sable Hammer, is clear. However, there may exist horizons yet unseen, shifts in the currents of causality that cannot be predicted, a new outcome triggered by the illogical ripples humanity creates. Having noted this small possibility, the role of this recording, which spans 1,206 years, starting from the first generation of the Arnor family, now comes to a close. May fortune favor humanity. Causality Recording Engine 03 Azoth